laugh. There's a reason why we begin to speak in tongues when the Spirit of God touches us. Because our physical bodies don't know how to react to this heavenly force. This divine God touching our physical bodies, our spirits. And in the natural, our bodies can't contain it. That's why we fall down. That's why we speak in tongues. That's why we cry. Because it's the overflowing of the work that he's doing inside of us. It's not crazy. Well, maybe it is, but if it is, then good. Be a little crazy. Don't be afraid. Let it overflow. Let it begin to pour out of you. Let it bubble up inside and then overflow out. Sing it with me. It's
day of Jesus' return is coming soon. There's only two camps in this war. Are you for me or are you with me? I declare my greatness. I show you how faithful I am. And yet you still question if I will take care of you. The world is being shaken. People are in fear and in trembling of what's going on around them. And they need a hope and a peace in all that's going on. Will my children rise up and declare my love? Will my children rise up and declare my peace? Wake up. It's time. It's time for revival. It's time to see this world moved. For the name of Jesus, the greatest name forever and ever. Amen. might say, who's here and who's not here? But the reality is, who's here and who's not here is not as relevant as the fact that he's here. And I think that sometimes in the church, we, we, get, we get hung up on that. Could you walk out of here this, today and say, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord right now? I believe so. Because we met with the Lord. Done. We're not done. You know, and I've had, this is something I've, I've had to come to grips with myself. Not to look to the left or to the right. But as the scripture says, setting my hand to the plow and looking unto him, the author and the perfecter of my faith and of your faith. And as we were, we were just spending this time in God's presence... You know, I thought about when you get sick and you go to the doctor, they give you antibiotics. They give you a bottle of pills. And they tell you, don't take this until you feel better. Take this until the bottle's empty. You got to take the full prescription. Because if you only take it until you feel better... What's in there may not be dealt with. You got to take the full course of the prescription. And we'll listen to, to a medical doctor, to a man or a woman, whoever it may be that prescribed it, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll finish off that bottle. And as we were praying and just in this time this morning, what God spoke to my heart is that as the church, we need to stay in God's presence until God's done doing what he's doing, not until we feel a little bit better. Because we feel, oh, I, I feel a little, I feel a little joy, I feel a little giggle, I feel a little tear roll down my cheek, and and, and and that's all well and good, but maybe that's just the beginning. I want us to to, to stay in His presence as long as we need to stay, and that and that's corporately and individually until God's done doing what needs to be done. I'm tired of just of just just band aids and topical treatments. I want God to get in there deep. Get in there deep. Some of you got some deep things. Some of you got some stuff that's way down in there deep. And we come in on a Sunday morning and, and we drop in for an hour or two on a Sunday morning and, and, and God starts to do something and it feels a little better. But it's still there. We're going to go anywhere as, as 
a church, if we're going to go anywhere as, as believers, we're only going to go as far as, as, as we're only going to go as far as as, as as we allow God to get deep and, and work in us. Disciples, ten days in an upper room. They just waited until God showed up. God showed up today. God shows up every day. But I want that overflow. I want that overflow. I want that overflow to continue. I want that overflow to continue. Do you have something you wanted to say this morning? I have a word that God gave me this week, and the Holy Spirit told me I need to share it. God had given me a vision in 2017 that this next move of God, this next wave of revival, as that time harvest was going to be led by young people. But young people need to be trained. Young people need to, to see mentors, people, older people that are on fire for God. God wants to start a fire in each of us. I saw a picture of the riots, the streets full of, of, of young people. And the Holy Spirit said, that's the devil's counterfeit for what I want to do with this generation of young people. And he said, you see the streets full of young people right now, that's the devil's counterfeit, but we're going to see the streets filled with young people on fire for God, taking the Holy Spirit, and there's going to be an army. So we need as mentors, as people that are, are influencing young people, we need to have, carry the fire so that they can carry the fire to the streets and change this world for the kingdom of God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Alexa, for leading us this morning, for being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Um, actually, I left my stuff in the back. Oh, I'm going to go back there and get it. You're glad to be in God's house this morning. Say amen and hug it for me. Amen. amen. If you're watching online, drop us a comment. Let us know you're there. God is alive. Amen. And he is on the throne. Amen. And nothing that comes up in this world is ever going to change the reality that he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. And I want, to, I, want to tell, I want to say something this morning that, that I believe that our church, our church, and listen, and when I say the church, again, I don't mean the building, I mean us, this, this, these group of people sitting right here can be instrumental in what God wants to do in our country in the days and weeks ahead. Because I believe what I see in our church, represented in our church, is what's possible when people begin to put Jesus first and themselves second. What I see in our church, in the way of community, in the way of relationship, in the way of love and concern and compassion, one for another, is what is possible when the church does what the church is, is supposed to do, and that is to put Christ above all else. And I am thankful that we, we are a church. Look, I look, I look at our church, and, and I thank God that God has allowed me in all of my ministry to be a part of churches that have been multi-generational. Because I believe the Church of Jesus Christ is a multi-generational entity. It's young and it's old. I believe, I'm thankful that all throughout our ministry, that God has allowed us, Pastor Christy and I, from when we were kids to today, to be a part of a church that is multinational. Because the Church of Jesus Christ is a church that represents all the nations of the world. You read in scripture and it says in the book of Revelation that in that day in heaven, there's going to be people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. And I am thankful that God has allowed us and continues allowing us to be a part of a church that represents the kingdom in all its beauty. I am thankful that we are get to be a part of a church that is multiracial because we're going to, we can show the world that we can love one another because Christ has first loved us. Now listen, we can do that in here, but we've got to also live it out out there. Doesn't matter who it is. Doesn't matter what they look like. Doesn't matter where they come. How much money is in their account, whether they have gray hair, white hair, blue hair, black hair, no hair. It doesn't matter. We are called to take the love of Christ to a world that's broken and hurting and in need of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. And listen, church, we're going to continue to do that. We're going to
continue to do that. Not because it's politically correct. Because I'm going to tell you, long before there was political correctness, there was the love of Jesus. Long before there was political correctness, there was a Savior who went to a cross for every man, woman, and child that would ever draw breath on the face of the earth. And when we get caught up, listen to me, when we get caught up in agendas, when we get caught up in political games, we lose sight of the cross and what Jesus came to do. And I'm going to tell you right now, as long as I have breath in my lungs and God has called me to be the pastor of this church, we are going to keep Jesus at the front. We are going to keep Jesus at the center. We are going to put Jesus in the place where he belongs, and that is out in front of us, leading us, guiding us, and making the way that needs to be made. Amen? Amen. Amen. Listen, I get a little excited. I get a little excited because I, I'm, I'm tired of Christians thinking that it's about, it's about political parties. It's not. I'm tired of Christians thinking it's about anything but Jesus. 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 It's about Jesus. He's the one that changes hearts. He's the one that transforms lives. He's the, one that take, he's the one that takes enemies and makes them into allies. He's the one that takes the broken and, 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 and re repairs, and I love the one word in that song, restores. He restores. He restores. That's the message I want to take to the world. That's the message I've, I've been called to take to the world. That's the message you and I have been lift, called to, pro, to proclaim everywhere we go. And if anything else starts coming out of our mouth before Jesus, as far as an answer for the world that we live in, then as a Christian, we are messed up in our theology and in our thinking. If anything comes out of our mouth before Jesus, as far as restoring hope in this world, then we have got a messed up view of the Bible and what it says. Because when I read the Bible, the Bible tells me that as the day of Christ's return draws nearer, things are getting going to get worse. They're going to get worse. Read the Bible. It's not going to get better. We're not going to improve things. There's going to be wars and rumors of war. There's going to be disease and sickness. There's going to be all kinds of problems. But we have the answer, and the answer is Jesus. So listen, we can do all kinds of things, but let's never forget to give him Jesus. To give him Jesus. Because when Jesus gets a hold of the life, he takes a guy like Paul, excuse me, Saul, a murderer, a bad man, a man full of hatred and anger. He turns him into Paul, proclaimer of Jesus, a bringer of hope. When a guy, when, when, when Jesus comes on the scene, he takes a guy like Peter, a, a, a man who's full of anger. A man who's full of, 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 of fear. A man who's got a lot of things going on that don't make him the, the, the best option, if you will, to, to be one of the leaders in the early church. But when a, when a man named Jesus gets, the whole, gets a hold of a man named Peter and the Holy Spirit fills that man named Peter, that's a life that's transformed. And I'm telling you right now, what we need more than anything is hearts to be transformed. Amen. Hearts to be changed. Are there problems in our country? Better believe it. Are there issues that need to be dealt with and addressed? Absolutely. If you don't think so, get your head out of the sand. It's time to come out of the cave. There are issues that need to be addressed and things that need to be dealt with 100% absolutely. But as I said at the beginning of all this, the number one thing, the number one name that needs to be proclaimed is the name of Jesus. Amen. Because he will bring the change that needs to be wrought. He's the one that can take a racist heart and change it. He's the one that can take a bigot and transform him. 
He's the one that can take a self-righteous individual and turn them into something different because they come face to face with Jesus. And that's what our world needs today. This has nothing to do with my notes. But that's okay. I do want to get into a little bit of my message this morning, and so we're, 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 going, to, we're going to move on from here. But I want to ask you to continue to pray. Continue to pray. Continue to pray. Listen, to that is the church of Jesus Christ. Not, not just pray, but be part of the answers. Be part of the solutions. If you have an opportunity to have a conversation with someone, have a conversation that's going to bring healing. If you have an opportunity to have a discussion with someone, have a discussion that points people to Jesus. I was asked to make one announcement. I want to, I want to do this before I forget. And that's a reminder that, that youth camp, there's information available about youth camp. Our district is planning on moving ahead with youth camp in July. If you have questions, see Benjamin today for details or with questions, or you can follow up with us today or tomorrow. Uh, but I just wanted to share that information that youth camp is planned. They're planning on going ahead with youth camp in July. Um, and then also, want to again, if someone's already did welcome everyone, whether you're inside, outside, or online, we're glad you're here. Also, want to remind you, whether you're inside, outside, or online, that there are opportunities for you to give. If you're here this morning in the sanctuary before you leave, you can drop your offering in the plate here. If you're in the parking lot before you leave, we'll have someone outside as you're dismissed to receive your offering outside, your tithes and offerings. And if you're online, uh, Tim can throw that up on the screen, how you can give online as well. But today, my, my plan was to start a, a series on the fruit of the Spirit. And, and, the, and I titled this, excuse me, I, I have been a little different. I titled it Living Different. Living Different. Because if there's anything we need to do every single day, we need to live different than the flesh wants to live. We need to live different. We need to live lives that, that cause us to be set apart. As the scripture says, it says, you are, I love, I, I think it's the King James Version, Pastor Christie, that says that you are a peculiar people. King James Version says, you are a peculiar people. I love that version. Peculiar, I don't know what it means to you, it means strange. It means different. It means maybe a little weird. It means, you know, when you walk into a room, people turn and look because there's something about you that has attracted their attention to you. You know, maybe, you know, it, 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 and, and peculiar can be for a lot of reasons. Do you ever go through an airport and see a basketball team walk through an airport? You watch, anybody watch basketball on TV? You guys watch basketball on TV? Anybody watch basketball? You watch, and you look and you're like, oh yeah, this is cool. What you don't realize is how really big they are. Because when you're watching a basketball game on TV, you have seven footers standing next to seven footers. So they just all look normal next to each other. I remember one time I was traveling to an airport and I forget, I, forget, I don't remember what team it was, but it was an NBA team and they were going through the airport and, and they were just around regular people. And man, did they stand out. I mean, I'm 6'2", 6'3", and, and I look like a little kid standing next to these guys that are 7 feet, 7'1", 300 plus pounds. These are massive individuals. When they walk through that airport, everyone stopped and looked because there was something about them that was so discernibly different than everyone else that they were walking by that you couldn't help but take notice. Same thing for professional football players. If you've ever watched TV, you know, it says, oh, you know, they, 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 you don't get a full grasp of how big these guys are until you stand next to a guy who's six foot six, 350 pounds, a massive individual, and you, it just catches your attention because they're so different. And the Bible says that we are to be peculiar. We are to be so different that we stand out and people notice us when we walk in a room. We got to live different. We got to live different. And today again, we're starting this series on, on the fruit of the Spirit. And it's my prayer that it will challenge and encourage you to live a life where the fruit of the Spirit is so evident in your life. And I'm telling you right now, in the world that we live in, when the fruit of the Spirit 
is evident in your life, you will stand out like a sore thumb. People will take notice. There's something strange about you. Alma, there's something peculiar about you. You're a little weird, and I mean it in the most loving and affectionate way, but people will say that kind of stuff about you. They'll say, Jojo, you, 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 you're, you're not the guy you used to be, and you've heard this already from people. You're different. You're strange. You're weird. You go to church regular. You give. You're, you're, you, you do ministry. You're, you're, you're different. You're strange. You're weird. It needs to be evident in us. And it needs to be grubby because if there's anything our world needs, it's more of the stuff listed in Galatians chapter 5. And that's where the fruit of the Spirit is mentioned. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 5. Starting in verse 1, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It says this, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. You know what that tells me right there? That even if you've been set free by Christ, something can happen in your life to put you back in the bondage you may have once been in before, or maybe even a new bondage. It says he has set you free, now make sure that you stay free. You and I have a responsibility to keep ourselves free in Christ. He says, and don't get tied up again in the slavery to the law. He goes on in verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. You know, just a few minutes ago, Benjamin stood up here and he said, you know, whatever we don't give to God, you know what, becomes fair game for the devil. When, we, when it's surrendered to God, then God becomes uh, the protector of whatever we surrender to him. Put your children in God's hands and trust God to watch over your children. Put your marriage, as he said, in God's hands and watch God watch over your marriage. Put your finances in God's hands and watch God be Lord over your finances. Whatever we don't give to God, and I love the way he put that, we leave open for the enemy to have his way with. And it says here, so I say to you, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. And then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. And then this is where he starts to list the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Do you know we're called to be fruit inspectors? You know, we're, we're, we're allowed to look at, 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 at lives and see what kind of fruit is, is, is being born, if you will out of that life. The Bible says that, that the fruit of the Spirit, this Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. So if a life is surrendered to the Holy Spirit, we ought to be seeing this kind of fruit. If we don't see this kind of fruit, then there's a question about whether who the, who the one that's bearing the fruit is in an individual's life. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I love this. There is no law against these things. You can ask my kids if they have ever gotten in trouble and punished for being loving one to another. You can ask them if they've ever gotten in trouble or punished for that. Uh, how about you? Did you ever, as a kid growing up, get in trouble for just being for just being loving and kind to someone? Did a teacher ever send you to the principal for, for, for giving a, a compliment to a classmate? Oh, you look so nice today. I just love your dress. Oh, that's it. Go to the principal right now. That kind of stuff doesn't get you in trouble. It says love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against these things. And those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Every part of our lives. 
See, we need that fruit of the Spirit to stand out. That's what sets us apart from the world. We need the fruit of the Spirit to stand out. And today, we're going to take a look at one of those. And here's the thing. We're not starting at the beginning. We're not starting with, with love. We're starting with the last one. We're going to look at the fruit of self-control for a few minutes this morning. We're going to look at the fruit of self-control. Control. what So much of our life revolves around being in control. And we like it that way. We like being in control. Think about it. We have so many devices, gad devices, gadgets, and thoughts that revolve around control. In your house, think about in your house, just right now, just take a quick moment, just, just, just 10 seconds, and just think of a few things that are in your house that give you control. Ooh, we're not going to get to that. That's, we're going to get to that one a little later. That's, that's a big one. That's a big one. But think about it. You know, think about it in our house. If we get a little cold, what do we do? We control the temperature in the room. We turn the heat up a little. If we get a little hot, what do we do? We, we, we go the other way. We take control. We turn it down. And then we come to church, and man, our dander gets up. We get a little excited because we walk into church, and it's a little hotter than we like. And we're like, why is it so hot? here. And you know what? And you got people in the other room saying, why is it so cold in here? Because we like to be in control. I think the person who invents the individual climate control church seat will be a millionaire in no time. <laughs> Where every one of you can sit in your chair and control it to your liking. Those of you that are a little hot, you'll turn a little warmer. A little, ooh, a little seat warmer in the church seats. That'd be nice. But we love control. We have our remote controls to change our TVs. And not only, and it's, it's not enough just that we can choose what to watch. And nowadays, there's too many choices. How many people remember, you know, six channels and they went off at midnight? All right, now, you know, now I, got, I had a conversation, I think with one of my kids, I was like, yeah, when I was a kid, if we wanted to watch cartoons, it was right before school you could catch some cartoons, right after school you could catch a couple of things, and Saturday morning. That was about it. It wasn't, a, it wasn't cartoons 24-7. You, you didn't get to pick and choose. And, and so, you know, you, you enjoyed what you had. Today, you have all kinds of choices. And we've gotten so lazy, we don't, you know, we don't even want to get up to change the channel to make those choices. How do you remember the first remote control? And I don't mean your children. Okay? I was the first remote control in my house. Get up and change it. Okay. Change the channel. But I remember first remote controls. Many of them were wired. Anybody remember those when remote controls would a wire ran to the TV and you pushed the button and that that you you know you could only go as far as the wire. You know that that that, that, that the wire would let you. Now we we love our remote controls to change the TV. We want control, and whoever has the remote has the power. Has the power. We also have, um, in the way of control, we have uh, our phones. Our phones are controlled by our voices. Man, we're so lazy, we can't even dial a number anymore. We love the, the freedom of control. Hey, Siri. Let's see if she starts up. Hey, Siri. She's sleeping. No, she's awake. <laughs> hey, Siri. Text JoJo. You're weird. <laughs> Wake up, JoJo. Church is no longer.
We have passwords and PIN numbers that limit access to accounts and computers. You know, if you wanted to go downstairs right now to my office, you couldn't get on my computer. It's locked. What a password. Gives me control over who has access to my computer. We love control. We like the idea of being in control, but here's, the, here's one of the challenges I see. Is that this is why I wanted to start with this one this morning. One of the problems that, that we have right now is so many of us are frustrated because we feel out of control. How many of you woke up at least one day this week and, and life just felt a little out of control? Just a little out of control. You know, I, this, a, a couple of weeks ago we were, we were, we, we, uh, you know, Tony the dryer went and finally gave up the ghost, Tony. Really? It gave it up. I, you know, I did, I did and whatever and it just, we had to get a new one. And so we had to get a new dryer. So Benjamin and I went out to the store to get a new dryer. We drove up to Home Depot. We need a dryer. We got eight people in the house. That's a lot of washing. And a lot of washing means a lot of drying. And I'm not hanging it outside, okay? For those who say, why don't you just hang it outside? It, no, it's too much. So we needed a new dryer. And so we jumped in the car because you know what? In our country, in our culture right now, you need something, what do you do? Drive to the store and get it. So we jumped in the car, we, we looked online, control. I don't want to walk an aisle. I'll pull it up online and I'll see who's got what and how much they're charging. We found it. Home Depot had what we wanted. Rolled over there. They were closed. It was 4 o'clock in the afternoon and Home Depot was closed. And I was mad. I'm like, I need a dryer and you have my dryer in there. Sorry, sir, we're closed. I'm like, why are you closed? It's 4 o'clock. And at that point, it was, they said it's for security reasons. That was back about a week and a half or two weeks ago when, when things in Philly started heating up with, with protesting and riots. And they were worried about things working their way um, up Broad Street and, and, and heading up this way. And so, so Home Depot was shut down early for security purposes. I don't care about security. I need a dryer. I, I, I want to be in control of this situation. And it frustrated me because I wasn't. And we face, we've been facing so many things like that. How many of you over the last two months have been frustrated because you wanted to go somewhere and couldn't go somewhere? Anybody raise your hand. I, I have, you haven't been, please tell me your secret. I just want to go places. I want to do things. I want to I I have places where I can drop off my kids and get them out of the house. My kids have been frustrated. You know, their, their teachers are telling them, you should read this book. And then, where's I supposed to get the book? The library's closed. And there's been frustration because there's been a lack of control. The truth is that there's a lot of things in life that are out of our control if we're completely honest with ourselves. And if all you do is constantly think about what you can't control, it can become a frustrating way to live. But I'm here to tell you this morning that we can have control in many areas of our lives, and we need to have control. And the Spirit, in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about that one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. And today I want to address three things quickly with you that are within our ability to control with the help of the Holy Spirit. For as much as you may be frustrated about the things you can't control, I'm going to tell you three things you can start working on that you can control and begin to make a change in the way you live and in your testimony. So as we read Galatians, we, we see that the Holy Spirit produces fruit in us, and that fruit needs to be manifested in our lives. And, and we talked about this a few weeks ago on one of our uh, 6 o'clock sessions, things that we can control. Listen, I can't control my neighbors. I can't. I can't control the weather. I can't control traffic. One thing that's, that's, that, that I noticed over the last couple of days, traffic's getting bad again. Some of you enjoyed getting around town the last few weeks with no traffic. Just zipping around, you know, whether some of you still had to get to work and, and do some grocery shopping and you enjoyed that. Guess what? It's coming back fast. And we can't control that. There's a lot of things we cannot control, but here's three things we can. Number one. And I'm telling you, as we can begin to work on these three things, it can change how people see us. Number one, we need to take control of our thoughts. We need to take control of our thoughts. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this. 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do you know this world has a pattern? Do you know this world has a way of doing things that doesn't line up with God and his word? And the Bible tells us that we cannot conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You got to start, you and I have to start changing the way we think. We are no longer part of the world, but we are part of the family of God, of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And when that happens, we've got to change the way we think, take control of our thoughts. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You can't control what I think. I can't control what you think. But with the Holy Spirit's help, I can start to change how I think. We need to take control of our thoughts and stop conforming to the pattern of this world. And that applies in so many areas. That applies in so many, so many areas. And, 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 and the dangerous thing is that when we don't read the Word of God, when we're not familiar with the Word of God, when we're not filling ourselves up with the Word of God, the thoughts and patterns of this world will fill us, and that is the way we will begin to think, and that is not what God has called us to do. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know what this world says? Be first. That's what this world says. This world says, me first. This world says, my problem's bigger than your problem. Meet people like that? Meet people like that? You, you got an issue and they don't want to hear about your issue because their issue's worse than your issue. This world says that, that, that we, we have to be at odds with each other over something all the time. Men with women, old with young, color with, with, with black, with white, white with Hispanic, Hispanic. Oh, everybody's got to have a problem with somebody. That's what this world says. But my Bible says that when we become a, a new creation in Christ, that we are no longer Jew nor Greek, slave, Gentile, but we become sons and daughters of the Most High God. And that's the thing that has to begin to take root in our minds. Amen. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to do what is good and pleasing and perfect, which is his will. Taking control of your thoughts. We need to also take, have new thought patterns and ways of seeing things. Philippians 4.8 says this, and this is one way to change, take control of our thoughts. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You know how you change your thoughts? You know how you take control of your thoughts? You start thinking the right things. You start thinking the right thoughts. You start thinking about things that are pure and noble and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy, and you fill your mind with that, and you will begin to have control over your thought life. Well, why is that so important, Pastor Ben? Why is that such a big deal? Because thoughts translate into actions. Thoughts translate into words. If you're just thinking about misery, if you're just thinking about things that are, that, that are everything, the opposite of what's listed here, that's going to be manifested in your life in other ways, in how you act, in how you talk. Your thought life needs to be transformed, and then start doing that by thinking about those things that are listed in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. What we focus on becomes our reality. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. See, when we begin to put on the mind of Christ, see, when I put on the mind of Christ and you put on the mind of Christ, you know what we start doing? We start thinking the same thoughts. 
When we start thinking the, the same thoughts, when we start focusing on what God wants and how God has called us to live, it starts to change how we live and how we act, and we start acting differently one towards another because we are perfectly united in mind and thought. Listen, I'm not surprised at the chaos that's going on right now in our, in our cities and around our country. I'm not. Because when Christ is not a part of a person's life, as I said earlier, selfishness and self-preservation becomes the order of the day. But when Christ rules and reigns in our hearts, it changes our priorities, how we think, how we live, how we act, and how we love. And that's what needs to happen. There needs to be a change in the way we think and in the way we act. And that happens when we are unified in mind and thought as brothers and sisters in Christ. To be united in mind and thought means we have the same source of information. Church, we need to have our take control over our thoughts. We need to take control over our words. Words are powerful. Words are powerful. The old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is the biggest lie perpetuated on playgrounds all over the world since the beginning of time. Words hurt. They cause pain. More than sticks and stones do. Some of you, as you sit here today, when you were a kid growing up, someone may have hit you with something and it hurt in the moment, but you don't really think about it much anymore. But someone called you a name, and that, left, that name has never left. There's days even now, years later, where you wake up and that name that you were called still resonates. You battle every day with that name that someone labeled you with. Words are powerful. Proverbs 13, 3 says this, Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. You know what? We've got to take control of our words, and sometimes that means keeping our mouths shut. You know, sometimes the best thing words you say are the words you don't say. And so we need to be in the church of Jesus Christ. We need to be mindful of the words that are coming out of our mouth. And I've, I've, ad I've, I've, I've amended that in, in, in recent years to also include whatever words come out of our fingertips. If you don't know what I mean by that, I mean the things we type. Because for so many of us now, the conversations we have are less and less mouth to ear, if you will, but fingertip to screen to eyes. We need to be so careful what comes out of us. We need to preserve life, and sometimes that means shut up and log off. James 1.26 says this, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Why is it so important to take control over our words? Because our words can take our so-called relationship with Jesus and nullify it, because what comes out does not line up with who he is. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, this person's religion is worthless. 1 Peter 3.10 For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Listen, I can't control what the news puts out there. I'm tired of people I, 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 I get on social media a fair amount. Number one, because I'm a father of six kids. I want to see what's, what's, what's happening out there. I want to see what's what's going on in, 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 in the world. Um, and, 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 and number two, as a pastor, I want to see what, what you guys are up to. And like I told you before, if you post it, it's fair game. If you tell me something in private, that's private. If you post it public, it's public. And I, I get on there because I, I, I want to encourage people to, to remember that, that we need to keep our, 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 our conversation, the words that come out of us, honoring to God in every way, shape, and form. Words have power. 
And I actually posted this the other day, and I don't remember where it was. I said, how can we shred each other as Christians? How can we shred each other on social media and then hope to come and worship together on Sunday? Take control of your words. So again, this idea of self-control, take control of your thoughts. Take control of your words. And then lastly, take control of your actions. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 18 says this. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. We live in an evil days? You better believe it. So don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Colossians 4, 5 says, Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Church, we are called to live, or excuse me, to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit called self-control. Operative word, self. Start thinking about what you think about. When you wake up in the morning, what thoughts are filling your head? When you go to bed at night, what thoughts are filling your head? And if you need to start changing your thoughts, then start doing that. And do it based on what the Word of God says. Start changing the words that come out of your mouth. We need to, say, we need to speak words of life. The Bible says there's life or death in the power of the tongue. There's blessing and cursing. Speak life. And listen, I'm going to say this right now. All the time. Because the Bible also says, can bitter and sweet water come out of the same well? No, it can't. So what's coming out of your mouth, you can't, you can't be double-minded. You need to be speaking, you're either speaking life or you're not. You cannot be double-minded. Sweet and bitter cannot come out of the same well. So take responsibility, take control over your words. And then the third one, take control over your actions. They often say that actions speak louder than words. I believe that actions speak loud and words speak loud, and we need to make sure we're having we're taking control over both. It's not an either-or situation. The fruit of the Spirit, excuse me, to have the fruit of the Spirit, first we need the Holy Spirit. And to have the Holy Spirit, we need to surrender our lives to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Did you catch that? In order to have the fruit of the Spirit, you need the Holy Spirit. In order to have the Holy Spirit, you need Jesus as your Savior. Because they're all part of the same package, if you will. And I say that because we have to understand that if someone doesn't know Jesus, then they're not going to know, they're not going to have the Holy Spirit working in them. They're not going to have the fruit of the Spirit. So we have to stop expecting them to live and act a certain way. The onus is on you and me to live out Jesus and to live out the fruit of the Spirit. See, he gave his life so that we could have forgiveness and eternal life but also that we might be able to receive the Holy Spirit and live differently. See, as we continue through this series on, on the fruit of the Spirit, basically the, 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 the title of, of all these sermons are going to be Live Different. Live Different. Live Different to compare to what? Live Different compared to those who don't know Jesus. Because when you live different, you attract questions. When you live different, you stand out. When you did live different, you become that peculiar people that draws someone's attention. You become, in, in effect, that seven-foot basketball player walking through the airport that people can't stop looking at and pointing at because they stand out so much from everybody else. That's the kind of people that God has called us to be. And we do that when we have and live out the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. See, Jesus gave his life so that we could have forgiveness. Amen? Amen. And, he, and, 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 and not just forgiveness, but eternal life. And I'm thankful for that today. But he also did that so that we could also then have a relationship with the Holy Spirit and live differently. Look how the Holy Spirit changed Peter. He knew Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. 
But when he had that encounter, that filling of the Holy Spirit, it changed him into something else. And we can have the same thing happen to us. Listen, I can't control the world. I wish I could. I wish in a snap of my fingers, I could change things. I wish I could make people who are closed-minded and bigoted no longer think and act that way. I wish I could take people who are evil and mean and want to cause harm and injury and snap my fingers and change them. I wish I could take broken homes and marriages and snap my fingers and they no longer exist. I can't do that. But what I can do is introduce a world to Jesus who can change a heart, who can suffer, um, bring healing to a home, who can restore a marriage, who can make a difference. I can introduce people to Jesus. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to introduce people to Jesus. And we do that, one of the ways we do that is by living out self-control. You know, this morning we're going to partake of communion together, and so if you've got that, you can pull those elements out. And when I look at, think about the communion elements, I think about self-control. I think about Jesus being in a garden, and if anyone didn't get any communion elements, um, they had them when you came in. If you didn't get them, Joshua, bring that in. Anybody in here not get communion? You walk right by it, son. Twice. Right over there, Joshua. When I think about communion, I think about self-control. And that's why I wanted to start it with it today, to celebrate communion together. I think about Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, praying, and praying the words, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's self-control. That says, I want, I, I want something different, but I, but, but, but I submit myself for what's best, God, for what your plan is, for what your purposes are. And Jesus in that moment, you know, it comes to grips with, with, with the fact that, that he's going to the cross. When I think about Jesus and, 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 his, and his crucifixion, and I think about him hanging on that cross, and the one thief on the one side of him says, if you're the son of God, save yourself and save us too. And I think about Jesus hanging on that cross, fully capable of calling down a legion of angels. But in that moment, understanding that that's not what needed to happen, he exhibited, if you will, self-control. Because he said, if I, if I call a legion of angels down, I, he might be saved from the, from the death on the cross, but you and I would be cursed to eternal damnation. And so he stayed on that cross, not because it was what was best for him, it's because of what was best for us. And talk, that's self-control. Self-control says, I may not like it, I may not want it, but I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to do what's honoring of God. I'm going to do what pleases him. And that's what Jesus did all through his life and ministry. So as we sit here today and we get ready to partake of this bread and hold that in your hands. I want you to know that same Holy Spirit that Jesus talked about sending. That same Spirit that raised him from the dead dwells in us and it can enable us to live that same kind of selfless, self-controlled life that Jesus did. A life of victory. A life of love. A life that brings hope. That's what this represents. At any point when he was being beaten, he could have said, enough, I'm done. But he didn't. Because he loved. Father, I thank you for this bread that reminds us of your love. I thank you for this bread that reminds us of healing. I thank you, God, of this, this, this bread that reminds us that, that you gave everything you had because of your love for us. God, I pray that the same way, God, you surrendered your will to the Father. I pray, God, that we would surrender every day our will to the Father. 
that we would think differently, talk differently, and act differently so that we might be a peculiar people and point people to Jesus. Father, thank you for this reminder. Thank you for this bread. Amen. Let's eat the bread together. And then the cup, he comes off that cross, we have no hope. He comes off that cross, we're doomed to pay the penalty for our own sins. He comes off that cross, we have no hope of eternity in heaven. He comes off that cross, our, our lives are so much different. But because he stayed on that cross, because he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Because he was willing to say, even when he was being wrongfully abused, uh, accused, beaten, tortured, I don't know what a better, uh, there's no better word, tortured. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When people treat us unfairly, we have a choice. We can curse them, we can say, God, forgive them. We can say, I hate you, or say, I love you, because Jesus first loved me. We have a choice. We have a choice of what we speak, how we think, and how we act. Jesus, thank you for showing that you loved us, saying that you loved us, and carrying through with your love for us by giving your life on that cross. God, I pray that we too would honor your, that we would honor your sacrifice by living a life of self-control and self-sacrifice. That others might come to know you, the one who loves them and gave his life for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink together. Amen. Whether you're in this room outside or watching online, I want you to know that Jesus loved you so much that he died for you. That's clear. We need, to kind of, we need to live the kind of life that loves people so much that we would die to self that they might come to know him. Self-control is, is just one of the fruits. There's others. But this week I want to encourage you to really make, make a point to think about that. Think about what you're thinking each day. Think about what you're saying each day. And think about what you're doing each day and ask yourself, am I honoring my Savior? Am I pleasing Him? Am I standing out in a world that desperately needs you and me to stand out? Why don't you stand to your feet this morning as we close? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, God, God did some amazing things already at this altar this morning. But if you're here this morning and you would like prayer for something else specifically, we'd be glad to pray with you. We'd be glad to, to, to agree with you in prayer, to, to lift you up in prayer. But I believe God did a lot of good things already this morning. And so what I'm going to do this right now is Lex is going to play. And we're, we're just going to do it. it what, what you might call a soft dismissal. I'm going to pray a blessing over you. If you've got to go, feel free to go. If you want to come and pray, come and pray. But you do which is right, what is right, excuse me, for you to do. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you, God, that we have had an amazing time in your presence this morning. Thank you for the ministry, the powerful ministry that took place. God, I pray that as we leave this morning that you would go with us. Let us practice self-control. Let us live lives that honor you. Let us live lives that point people to you. I pray blessing on your church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, if you have an offer, you can bring it here, give it as you leave, or give online. God bless you.